I thought the king had more effect at the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most, for equalities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? <laughs> His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am braced to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could... Whereupon she grew round-wombed, and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle as she had a husband for her bed. You smell a fault. I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir, by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account. Though this knave came something saucily into the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair. There was good sport at his making, and the our son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? Uh, no, my lord. My lord of Kent. Remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and see you to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years, and away he shall again. The king is coming. Attend the lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. I shall, my lord. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburthened, crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall, and you, our no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers, that future strife may be prevented now. The princes, France and Burgundy, Great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? that we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than word can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space and liberty, beyond what can be valued rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manner of so much, I love you. What shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady. To thine and Albany's issues be this perpetual. What says her second daughter? Our dearest Regan, wife of Cornwall. I am made of that self-metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short. But I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses and find I am alone felicitate in your dear highness' love. And poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. To thee and thine, hereditary ever, remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, 
no less in space, validity and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now our joy, although our last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interest. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. Now, oh, how could you amend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes? Oh, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. That goes thy heart with this. I, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever, the barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. God, my lady. Please, Kent, come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kindness, array. hence and avoid my sight. So be my grave, my peace, as here I give her father's heart. From her, call Florence. Who stares? Call Burgundy. Cornwall and Albany. With my two daughters, Darius, to jest the third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Herself, by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred nights, by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due term only. We shall retain the name and all the addition to a king, the sway, revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm this coronet part between you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn. Make from the sharp. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. What wouldst thou do, old man? Thinkest thou that duty shall have dread to speak when part of flattery bows? The plain is honor's bound when majesty falls to folly. Preserve thy state, and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are those empty-hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. Hint on thy life no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies. Now fear to lose it, thy safety being the motive. Thou to my sight see better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo... Now by Apollo, king, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Oh. That sir, miscreant, dear sir, for bad, will kill thy position and thy fee bestow upon the foul disease. Revoke thy gift, for whilst I can vent clamor from my throat, I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant, on thine allegiance, hear me. That thou hast sought to make us break our vow, which we durst never yet, 
and with strained pride to come between our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, our potency may good take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon a kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, that moment is thy death away. By Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king. As if thus thou wilt appear, freedom lives hence, banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinkst and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kento princes bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address toward you, who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present dower with her, or cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than hath your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right, noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. So there she stands. If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure feast, and nothing more, may fitly like your grace, she is there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Will you, with these infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes not up in such conditions. Then leave her, sir. For by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature's ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is most strange. But she whom even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best, the dearest, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. Sure, her offense must be of such unnatural degree that monsters it, a your forevouched affection fall into taint, which to believe of her must be a faith that reason without miracles should never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I well intend I'll do it before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious blot, mirth or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step, that hath deprived me of your grace and favour. But even for want of that for which I am richer, the still soliciting eye in such a tongue that I am glad I have not, though not to have it hath lost me in your liking. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this, a tardiness in nature which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do? My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Love's not love when it is mingled with regards. That stands aloof from the entire point. Will you have her? She is herself a darling. Royal king, give but that portion which yourself proposed, and here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing I have sworn. I am firm. I am sorry, then, you have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. Peace be with Burgundy, since that respect and fortune are his love, I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, and most loved despised, thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Gods, gods, this strange, that from their coats neglect, 
my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy darless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes of waterish Burgundy can buy this unprized, precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind, thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast of France, let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our business on. Come, noble Burgundy. Bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father. With washed eyes Cordelia leaves you. I know you what you are. And like a sister, are most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well, our father. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duties. Let your study be to content your lord, who hath received you at fortune's arm. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides, who covered faults at last with shame derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister, it is not little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you. Next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it has not been little. He always loved our sister most. And with what poor judgment he has now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long ingrave condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment. There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let's hit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall further think of it. We must do something, and in the heat. Nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why, bastard, wherefore base? And my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue. My brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy. Base, base, who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got between us sleep and wake. Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate Fine word. Legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards. Kent banished thus, and France in colour parted, and the king gone tonight prescribed his power confined to exhibition. All this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now? What news? Uh, so please your lordship none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No. What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? 
The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I, I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your all looking. Yes. Give me the letter, sir. I, I shall offend neither to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification he wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me that of this I may speak more, if our father would sleep till I waked him should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy? Sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue. My son Edgar, had he a hand to write this, a heart and brain to breed it in? When came you to this? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's. If the matter were good, my lord, I just swear it was. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Oh, never, my lord. I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers decline the father should be as ward to the son and the son manage his revenue. Oh, villain. Villain. His very opinion in the letter. A horrid villain. Unnatural, detested, brutish villain. Worse than brutish. Go, sir, seek him. I'll apprehend him. A Abominable villain, where is he? I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can mm. derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course. Where if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. Mm -hmm. I dare pawn down my life for him that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honor and to no other pretense of danger. Think you so? If your honor judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this, and by an auricular assurance have your satisfaction, and that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not sure. To his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth! Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the secret effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction there's son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully, and the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. His offense, honesty. It is strange. <laughs> this is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters, the sun, the moon, and stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treachers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting arm. 
an admirable evasion of whore master man to lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous. <laughs> Tut. I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing, and Edgar's... <laughs> Pat, he comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh like Tom O'Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Ah, so la me. Oh, no, Brother Edmund. What serious contemplation are you in? I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? <laughs> Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of succeed unhappily, as of unnaturalness between the child and the parent. Death, dearth, dissolutions of ancient amities, divisions in state, menaces and maledictions against king and nobles, needless diffidences, banishment of friends, dissipation of cohorts, nuptial breaches... And I know not what. How long have you been a sectary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you my father last? The night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by word nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him. Huh? And at my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time have qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rages in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray ye go. There's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man if there be any good meaning toward you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you away. Uh, shall I hear from you or not? I do serve you in this business. Hmm. A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit, or with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Aye, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say that I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He's coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distaste it, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine I know in that are one not to be overruled. I give a good man that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now, oh, by my life, old fools are babes again and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused. Remember what I tell you. Well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter, advise your fellows so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my course. Prepare for dinner. If but as well I other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raise my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come. Thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labors. <laughs> Let me not stay a jot for dinner. Go get it ready. How oh, now? What art thou? A man, sir. <laughs> what dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? Oh, I do profess to be no less than I seem. To serve him truly that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, 
to fight when I cannot choose and to eat no fish. What art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. If thou beest as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. <laughs> <laughs> what would sir? Service. Who would so serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir. But you have that in your countenance, which I would fain call master. <laughs> What's that? Authority. <laughs> <laughs> what services canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale in telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Uh, not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, nor so old to dote on her for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have years on my back, 48. <laughs> Follow me. Thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I'll not part from thee yet. Dinner! Oh, dinner! Where is my knave? My fool. Go you, call my fool hither. Oh, you, you, sirrah. Where's my daughter? Sir, please, help me. What says a fellow there? Call the clock pull back. Oh! Where's my fool? Oh, I think the world's asleep. How now, where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came the slave not back when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. <laughs> he would not. My lord, I... I know not what the matter is, but... To my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence as in the duke himself also and your daughter. Ah, uh, say so, so. I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken. For my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wrong. Uh, but remember, it's me and mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, which I rather blamed on mine own jealous curiosity than a very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I'll look further into it. But where is my fool? I haven't seen him this two days. Since my young lady is going into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I've noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Go you call hither my fool. <clears throat> oh, you, you, sir. Come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father. My lord's knave. You horse and dog. You slave. You cur. I'm none of these, my lord. I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? <laughs> I'll not be struck, my lord. Not trip neither. You best. <laughs> <laughs> I thank thee, fellow. Thou service me. I love thee. Come, sir. <laughs> Arise, away. I'll teach you differences. Away, away. <laughs> if you will measure your lover's length again, Tarry, but away. <laughs> <laughs> now, my friendly knave, I thank thee. There's earnest of thy service. <laughs> Let me hire him, too. Here's my coxcomb. Oh, no, my pretty knave. How dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. Why, fool? Why? For taking one's part that's out of favour. Nay, thou canst not smile as the wind sits, thou'lt catch cold shortly there, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two one's daughters, and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. Ha, 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 now, uncle, <laughs> would I have two coxcombs and two daughters? <laughs> Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. They're mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Uh, take heed, sir, at the whip. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, truth's a dog, Master Kennel. He must be whipped out when the lady's brack may stand by the fire and stink. A pestilent gall to me. Uh, sirrah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, uncle. Have more than thou showest. Speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest. Ride more than thou goest. <laughs> Learn more than thou throwest. Set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. <laughs> Can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, oh, no, boy. Nothing 
can be made out of nothing. Oh, pretty tell him. So much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. A bitter fool. <laughs> Dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad, teach me. That law that counseled thee to give away thy land, come, place him here by me. Do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou uh, call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away that thou was born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. Uh. Oh, no, faith. Ah, lords and great men will not let me. If I had a monopoly out, they would have part on't. And ladies, too. They would not let me have all the fool to myself. They'll be snatching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give me an egg, Nanko, and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why, after I have cut the egg in the middle and et up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. Uh. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts, thou borest thine ass on thy back o'er the dirt. Thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. <laughs> Fools had ne'er less grace in a year, for wise men are grown foppish, and know not how their wits to wear, their manners are so apish. Uh, when were you wont to be so full of songs, Sarah? Oh, I have used it, Uncle, ere since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers, for when thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches, and they for sudden joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung, that such a king should play Bo Peep and go the fools among. Uh, Sarah. Uh, uh, prithee, Uncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. Yeah, and you lie, Sarah, we'll have you whipped. Oh, I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true, thou'll have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I'm whipped for holding my peace. Oh, I'd rather be any kind of thing than a fool. And yet I would not be thee, uncle. Thou hast paired thy wits on both sides, and left nothing in the middle. Oh, here comes one of the pairings. Oh, no, daughter. What makes that front lid on? You're too much of late in the frown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. <laughs> Oh, yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue. So your face bids me, though you say nothing. Mum, mum, he that keeps nor crust nor crumb, weary of all, shall want some. That's a shell of peace cot. Not only, sir, this your all licensed fool, but others of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress. But now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done, that you protect this course and put it on by your alliance. Which if you should, a fault would not scape censure, nor the redresses sleep which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their workings do you that offence which else for shame, that then necessity will call discreet proceeding. For you know, Uncle, the hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it's had its head bit off by its young. So out went the candle, and we were left darkling. Are you our daughter? I would you would make use of your good wisdom, whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions which of late transport you from what you rightly are. Oh, may not an ass know when the cart draws the horse? Whoop, Jack, I love thee. Does any here know me? This is not Leah. Does Leah walk thus, speak thus, where his eyes? Either his notion weakens his discernings a lethargy. Ha! Ah, waking, tis not so. Who is it who can tell me who I am? Leah Shadow? I would learn that. For by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair gentlewoman. This admiration, sir, is much of the savour of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes are right, as you are old and reverend, should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this our court infected with their manners shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself doth speak for instant remedy. 
Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to disquantity your train, and the remainders that shall still depend to be such men as may besought your age, which know themselves and you. Darkness and devils, saddle my horses, pull my train together, degenerate bastard. I'll not trouble thee, yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Woe that too late repents. My lord. Uh, oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses. Ingratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend. More hideous when thou showest the inner child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested. Kite, thou liest! My train are men of choice and rarest parts, that all particulars of duty know, and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. O most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show, which like an engine wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drove from my heart all love, and added to the gall, O Lear, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. My lord, I am guiltless, as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Here, nature, here, dear goddess, here, suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. In the womb, convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her delicate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart, disnatured torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth, with cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child away away oh god that we adore whereof comes this never afflict yourself to know more of it but let his disposition have that scope as dotage gives it what fifty of my followers and a clap within a fortnight what's the matter sir i'll tell thee life and death i am ashamed thou hast power Shake my manhood thus, that these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them. <laughs> Blasts and fogs upon thee, the untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Old fond eyes, beweep this cause again, I'll pluck ye out and cast you with the waters that you lose to temper clay. Ah, oh, let it be so, I have another daughter, who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee with her nails, she'll flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off forever. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, to the great love I bear Pray you, content. What, Oswald Ho, you, sir, more knave than fool after your must. And Uncle Lear, and Uncle Lear, tarry, take the fool with thee. A fox from mother's quarter, and such a daughter should short to the slaughter if my cap would buy a halter, so the fool follows after. This man hath had good counsel. A hundred knights. Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights. Yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, he may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say. Well, you may fear too far. Safer than trust too far. Let me still take away the harms I fear, not fear still to be taken. I know his heart. What he have uttered, I have writ my sister. If she sustain him and his hundred knights, when I have shown the unfitness... Uh, how now, Oswald? What have you writ that letter to my sister? Aye, madam. Take you some company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and there to add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. No, no, my lord, this milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not, yet under pardon... You are much more at task for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. 
striving to better after we mar what's well. Nay, then. Oh, well, the event. Go you before to Cornwall with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there for you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered your letter. If a man's brains are in his heels, what's not in danger of kives? Aye, boy. Then I prithee be merry. Thy wit shall not go slipshod. <laughs> 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 I shall see thy other daughter will use thee kindly, but though she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What can tell, boy? She will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle one's face. No. Why to keep one's eyes of either side's nose, that what a man cannot smell out he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes his shell. No. Nor I neither. Uh, but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put head in. Not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. Uh, I will forget my nature. So kind a father. Be my horses ready. Thy asses are gone about em. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they're not eight. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Thou wouldst make a good fool. I'll take it again for force. Monster ingratitude. If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me not be mad. Not mad. Sweet heaven. Keep me in temper. I would not be mad. And now are the horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. She that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long, unless things be cut shorter. <laughs> Save thee, Curran. And you, sir. I have been with your father, and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Reek and his Duchess will be here with him this night. How comes that? Hey, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean the whispered ones, for they are yet but here kissing arguments. Not I, pray you. What are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward, twixt the Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do then in time. Fare you well, sir. Duke be here tonight. Better? Best? This will use itself perforce into my business. My father hath set guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of a queasy question which I must add. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word! Descend! Brother, I say! Aye. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? The Duke? He's coming hither now in the night in a haste and regum with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I am sure, aunt, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yield! Come before my father! Light ho! Here! My brother! Torches! Torches! So farewell. Would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavor. I have seen drunkards do more than this in sport. Father, father! Stop, stop, no help! Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mm. mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, where by no means he Pursue could... him! Oh, go after! By no means, but... Persuade me. 
to the murder of your lordship, but that I told him that avenging gods against parricides did all the thunder bend, spoke with our manifold and stronger bond, the child was bound to the father. So in fine, seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose, in fell motion with his prepared sword, he charges home my unprovided body, latched mine arm. But when he saw my best alarmed spirits bold in the quarrel's right, roused to the encounter, or whether gasted by the noise I made, full suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught and found dispatch. The noble duke, my master, my worthy art and patron, comes tonight. By his authority I will proclaim it. But he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous card to the stake. He that conceals him, death. When I dissuaded him from his intent and found him piped to do it, with cursed speech I threatened to discover him. He replied, thou unpossessing bastard. Dost thou think if I would stand against thee with the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in me make thy words faith? No, what I should deny, as this I would, either thou didst produce my very character, I'll turn it all to thy suggestion, plot, and damned practice. And thou must make a dullard of the world if they not thought the prophets of my death were very pregnant and potential spirits to make thee seek it. Oh, strange and fastened villain. Would he deny his letter, said he. I never got him. Hark, the Duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes. All ports I'll bar. The villain shall not scape. The Duke must grant me that. Besides... His picture I will send far and near, that all the kingdom may have due note of him. And of my land, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. How oh, now, my noble friend, since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's great. What? Let my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named your Edgar? Oh, lady, lady, shame would have it here. Uh, was he not companion with the riotous knights that tended upon my father? I know not, madam. It is too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel, then, though he were ill-affected. Tis they have put him on the old man's death to have the expense and waste of his revenues. I have, this present evening, for my sister, been well informed of them, and with such cautions, that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I, assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. It was my duty, sir. He did bewray his practice, and receive this hurt, you see, striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? Aye, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. Make your own purpose how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself. You shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you? Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions noble Gloucester of some prize, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so hath our sister, of differences, which I best thought it fit to answer from our home. The several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend, lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our businesses, which craves the instant use. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Good dawning to thee, friend, out of this house. Aye. Where may we set our horses? In the mire. Oh, prithee, thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why, then I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury Pinfold, I would make thee care for me. Well, why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats. A base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted, stocking knave. A lily-livered, action-taking, horse-sun, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue. One trunk-inheriting slave, 
One that would be a bored in way of good service and of nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch. One whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced varlet art thou to deny thou knowest me. Is it two days since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Draw oh, your rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines. I'll make a supper the moonshine of you, your horse, and tell you in the barber monger. Draw away! I have nothing to do with it. Draw, you rascal! You come with letters against the king and take them into the puppet's part against the royalty of our father. Draw, you rogue! But I'm so covered under your shanks. Draw, you rascal! Come here, wait! Help! Oh, murder! Help! Strike, you slave! Stand, rogue! Stand on your meat stand Strike! How now, what's the matter? Part! Oh, you good boy, if you please. Come, I'll face you. Come on, young master. Weapons? Arms? What's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister, from the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. No marvel. You have so bestirred your valour, you cowardly rascal. Nature disclaims in thee. A tailor may be. Thou art a strange fellow. A tailor make a man. A tailor, sir. A stone cutter and a painter could not have made him so ill that we had but the two hours of the trade. Speak yet. How grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I've spared in suit of his grey beard. Thou horse and zed, thou unnecessary letter. My lord, if you will give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar and daub the wall of a jakes with him. <laughs> Spare my grey beard, you wet tail. Peace, sinner, you beastly knave. Know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger had the privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, oft bite the holy cords of twain, which are too entrenched to unloose. Smooth every passion that in the natures of the lords rebel. Bring oil to fire, snow to the cold of moods, renege, affirm, and turn their halcyon beaks with every gale and very other masters, knowing not like dogs, but following. Uh, a plague upon your epileptic visage! Smile you my speeches as I were a fool! Goose! If I had you upon Saturn Plain, I'd drive you tackling home to Camelot. What art thou mad, old fellow? How fell you out? Say that. No contraries hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. No more perchance does mine, nor his, nor hers. Sir, it is my occupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that I see before me at this instant. Mm -hmm. This is some fellow who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter he. An honest mind and plain he must speak truth, and they will take it so. If not, he's plain. <laughs> These kind of knaves I know which in this plainness harbour more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely. Sir, in good faith, in sincere verity, under the alliance of your great aspect, whose influence like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering Phoebus front... What means by this? To go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much. I know, sir, I am no flatterer. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave, which for my part I will not be though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. Oh, it pleased the king, his master, very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him. Got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued. And in the fleshment of this dread exploit, draw on me here again! Ah, none of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks! You stubborn ancient knave, your reverend braggart, we'll teach you. Sir, I'm too old to learn. C call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respects, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks! As I have life and honour, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord. And all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Your purpose, low correction, is such as basest and contemnest wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. 
The king must take it ill that he, so slightly valued in his messenger, should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. <laughs> Come, my good lord, away. I'm sorry for thee, friend. It is the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out, the rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. It will be ill taken. Good king. That must approve the common soul. Thou, out of heaven's benediction, comest to the warm sun. Approach, thou beacon, to this underglobe, that by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I notice from Cordelia, who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscure cause, and shall find time from this enormous state seeking to give losses the remedies for all oh, weary and all watched. Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. Time. Myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. While as I may escape, I will preserve myself, and am besought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. My face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hairs in knots, and with presented nakedness I'll face the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified arms pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Turligal, poor Tom, that's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned the night before, there was no purpose in them of this removal. Hail to thee, noble master. How? Makes thou this shame thy pastime? <laughs> no, my lord. <laughs> he wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the heads, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, and men by the legs. When a man's over lusty at legs, then he wears wooden nether stocks. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. No, no, they would not. Yes, they have. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear I. They durst not do it. They could not, would not do it. It is worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. 
Resolve me with all modest taste which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness letters to them, ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Gunnar his mistress salutations. Delivered letters spite of intermission which presently they read. On those contents they summoned up their meany, straight took horse, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer, gave me cold looks, and meeting here the other messenger whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. You raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet if the wild geese fly that way. Fathers that wear rags do make their children blind, but fathers that bear bags shall see their children kind. Fortune that Aaron Horner turns the key to the poor. But for all this thou shalt have as many dollars for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart. Hysterica passio, down thou climbing sorrow, thy elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not. Stay here. Made you no more offence but what you speak of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a number? And thou hadst been set in the stocks for that question, thou hadst well deserved it. Why, fool? We'll set thee to school to an ant to teach thee there's no labouring in the winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men, and there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking. Let go thy hole when the great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following. But the great one that goes upward, let him draw thee after. But a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That, sir, which serves and seeks for gain, and follows but for form, will pack when it begins to rain, and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away. The fool, no knave for thee. Where learned you this fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Deny to speak with me, they're sick, they're weary, they've travelled all the night, mere fetches. I, the images of revolt and flying off, fetch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery, what quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I would speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Inform them, dost thou understand me, man? Aye, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak, commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood. Fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke that... No, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office whereto our health is bound. We not ourselves, when nature being oppressed, commands the mind to suffer with the body. I'll forbear, and am fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Death on my state, wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go tell the duke and his wife I'd speak with them. Now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart, but down. Cry to it, uncle, as the cockney did to the eagles when she put him in the paste alive. She napped him all the coxcombs with a stick and cried, down, wantons, down. "'Twas her brother that in pure kindness to his horse buttered his hay. "'Good morrow to you both. "'Hail to your grace. "'I'm glad to see your highness. "'Regan, I think you are. "'I know what reason I have to think so. "'If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb, 
Suppose bring an adult dress. Oh, are you free? Some other time for that. Beloved Regan, thy sister is naught. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp-toothed unkindness like a vulture. Here, I can scarce speak to thee. Thou'd not believe with how depraved a quality. Oh, Regan. I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to scant her duty. Say, how's that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curses, Honor. Oh, sir. You are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore I pray you that to our sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her. Oh, ask her forgiveness. Oh, do you but mark how this becomes the house? <laughs> Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees I beg that you will vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue most serpent-like upon the very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Why, sir, you nimble lightnings dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fen-sucked fogs, drawn by the powerful sun to fall and blister her. Oh, the blessed God, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on. No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender, hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine to comfort, not burn. It is not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion to oppose the boat against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, Bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom thou hast not forgot, wherein I thee endowed. Good, sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know to my sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy, borrowed pride dwells in the sickly grace of her he follows out Vala from my sight. What means your grace? Who stopped my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know aunt. Who comes here? Oh, heavens, if you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Oh, Wigan, will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms, sir. Oh, sides, you're too tough, will you yet, old? How? Came my man in the stocks. I sent him there, sir. But his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? Did you? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision which will be needful for your entertainment. Return to her. And fifty men dismissed. No! Rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and howl necessity's sharp pinch. Return with her. By the hot blooded France that dourness took our youngest born, I could as soon be brought to knee his throne and squire like pension beg to keep. Base life afoot. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this 
detested groom. At your choice, sir. I pray thee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter. Or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, or embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will, I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bear a shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst, be better at thy leisure. I can be patient, I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old, and so... But she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many. Sith that both charge and danger speak gainst so great a number. How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack ye, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. But must I come to you with five and twenty? Regan said you so? And speak again. My lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favoured when others are more wicked. Not being the worst stands in some rank of praise. I go with thee. Thy fifty yet the double, five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty? Ten or five to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you. What need one? A reason not to meet. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life's as cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm or gorgeous, why nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearst, for scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, your heavens give me patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you, that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father. Fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger. And let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall... I will do such things, what they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I weep? No, I will not. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand floors. Oh, dear, I weep. Oh, fool. I shall go mad. Let us withdraw. It will be 
be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame hath put himself from rest and needs must taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. Well, so am I purposed. Where's my lord of Gloucester? Follow the old man forth. He's returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither. Tis best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the high winds do sorely ruffle. For many miles about there's scarce a bush. Oh, sir, to willful men the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. He is attended with a desperate train. And what they may incense him to being apt to have his ear abused, wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night, my regan counsels well. Come out of the storm. Minded like the weather, most unquietly. I know you. Where's the king? Contending with the fretful elements. Bids the wind blow the earth into the sea, or swell the curled waters above the main, that things might change or cease. Tears his white hair, which the impetuous blasts with eyeless rage catch in their fury and make nothing of. Strives in his little world of man to outscorn the to and fro conflicting wind and rain. This night, wherein the cub-drawn bear would couch, the lion and the belly-pinched wolf keep their fur dry, unbonneted he runs and bids what will take all. But who is with him? None but a fool, who labours to outjest his heart-struck injuries. Sir, I don't know you, and dare upon the warrant of my note commend the dear thing to you. There is division, although as yet the face of it is covered with mutual cunning, twixt Albany and Cornwall, who have... As who have not that their great stars, throned and set high, servants who seem no less, which are to France the spies and speculations intelligent of our state. What have been seen, either in snuffs and packings of the dukes, or the hard rain which both of them had borne against the old kind king, or something deeper whereof perchance these other furnishings? But true it is from France that comes a power into this scattered kingdom who already wise in our negligence have secret feet in some of our best ports and are at point to show their open banner. Now to you. If on my credit you dare build so far to make your speed to Dover, you shall find some that will thank you, making just report of how unnatural and benadding sorrow the king hath caused to play. I am a gentleman of blood indeed, and from some knowledge and assurance offer this office to you. I will talk further with you. No, do not. A confirmation that I am much more than my art wall, open this purse and take what it contains. If you shall see Cordelia, as fear not, but you shall, show her this ring, and she will tell you who that fellow is that yet you do not know. Fie, the storm! I will go seek the king. Give me your hand. Have you no more to say? A few words, but to effect more than all yet, that when we have found the king to which your came that way, I'll miss. He that first lights on him, or are the other. Executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, sings in my white head, and thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's molds, all German spill at once that make him grateful man. Holy water in the dry house is better than this rain water out of doors. Good my uncle, in. Ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a night pit is neither wise men nor fools. Rumble thy belly full, spit fire, spout rain. No rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I taxed not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom. 
called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers that will with two pernicious daughters join your high and gendered battles against a head so old and white as this. A heart is foul. He that has a house to put head in has a good headpiece. God peace that for the house before the head has any, that he that he shall love, so beggars marry many. The man that makes his toe what he his heart shall make shall of a corn cry woe and turn his sleep to wake. For there was never yet no woman but she made mouths in a glass. No, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Who's there? Mary, here's Grace and the codpiece. That's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Things that love night love not such nights as these. The wrathful skies gather the very wanderers of the dark and make them keep their caves. Since I was man, such sheets of fire, such bursts of horrid thunder, such groans of roaring wind and rain, I never remember to have heard. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction nor the fear. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful pudder o'er our heads find out their enemies now. Tremble, thou wretch that hast within thee undivulged crimes, unwhipped of justice. Hide thee, thou bloody hand, thou perjured and thou similar of virtue that hath incestuous. Caitiff to pieces shake, that under covered and convenient seeming hath practised on man's life. Close pent up guilt, strive your concealing countenance, and cry these dreadful summoners, Grace, I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Gracious my lord, hard by here is a hovel. Some friendship will it lend you against the tempest. Repose you there, while I to this hard house, more harder than the stones were oft is raised, which even but now, demanding after you, denied me to come in. Return and force their scattered courtesy. Oh. My wits, it's again to turn. Come on, my boy. How dost, my boy? Art cold? I'm cold myself. Where is this straw, my fellow? The art of our necessities is strange and can make vile things precious. Come, your hovel. Poor fool and knave. I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. <laughs> he that has and a little tiny bit, with hay, hold the wind and the rain, must make content with his fortunes, but though the rain, it raineth every day. True boy. Come, bring us to this hovel. <laughs> this is a brave night to cool a courtesan. I'll speak a prophecy ere I go. When priests are more in word than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles are their tailors' tutors, no heretics burn but wenches suitors, when every case in law is right, no squire in debt, nor no poor knight, when slanders do not live in tongues, nor cut purses come not to throngs, when usurers tell their gold in the field, and boards and whores do churches build, then shall the realm of Albion come to great confusion. Then comes the time who lives to see it, that going shall be used with feet. This prophecy many men shall make, for I live before his time. I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desired a leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house, charged me on pain of perpetual displeasure neither to speak of him and treat for him or any way sustain him. Most savage and unnatural. Go to, say you nothing. There is division betwixt the dukes and a worse matter than that. I have received a letter this night. It is dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged at home. There is part of a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will look him and privily relieve him. 
Go you and maintain talk with the Duke, that my charity be not of him perceived. If he ask for me, I am ill and gone to bed. If I die for it, as no less is threatened me, the king, my old master, must be relieved. There are strange things toward Edmund. May you be careful. This courtesy forbid thee, shall the Duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. <laughs> The tyranny of the open night's too rough for nature to endure. Let me alone. Oh, good, my lord, enter here. It will break my heart. I'd rather break my own. Good, my lord, enter. Thou thinkst as much to this contentious storm invades us to the skin. So it is to thee. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. Thou shun a bear. But if thy flight lay toward the roaring sea, thou shalt meet the bear in the mouth. When the mind's free, the body is delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there, filial ingratitude. It is not as this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food to it, but I will punish home. No, I'll weep no more. In such a night to shut me out. Pour on, I will endure. In such a night as this, for Regan, Goneril, your old kind father, whose frank heart gave all, for oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that, no more of that. Good, my lord, enter here. Let me go in myself, seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go in, in boy, go first. You houseless poverty. Forget me in. I'll pray, and then I'll sleep. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, but bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your loop? and window raggedness defend you from seasons such as these. Oh, I have ta'en too little care of this. Take physic, pom. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth. Away! The foul fiend follows me. Oh, the sharp wars on blow the wind. <laughs> Go to thy bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy daughters and art come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom? Hmm? Who the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through sword and whirlpool, or bog and quagmire, that hath laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew, set ratsbane by his porridge, made him proud of heart to ride on a bay trotting horse over four inch bridges to cause his own shadow for a traitor? Bless thy five wit. Tom is a cold. Duty, 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 duty. Bless if a whirlwind star blast him taking do poor Tom's uncharity whom the foul fiend vexes. There, could I have him now? And there, and there again. And there. What has his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Wouldst thou give them all? Nay, he deserved a blanket. 
else we'd all been shamed. Now all the plagues that in the pendulous air hang baited o'er men's faults light on thy daughters. He hath no daughters, sir. Death, traitor! Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness but his unkind daughters. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment. Twas this fresh begot those pelican daughters. Millicock sat on Millicock Hill. Hello, hello. His cold light will tell us all Ooh. to fools are him. Take heed of a foul fiend. Obey thy parents. Keep thy words justly. Swear not. Commit not with man's sworn spouse. Set not thy sweet heart on proud array. <laughs> Tom's a cold. What hast thou been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that curled my hair, wore gloves in my cap, served the lust of my mistress' heart, and did the act of darkness with her. Swore as many oaths as I spake words, and broke them in the sweet face of heaven. One that slept in the contriving of lust, and wake to do it. Wine loved I dearly, dice dearly, and in woman, out paramour the Turk. Horse of heart, light of ear, bloody of hand, hog in sloth, fox in stealth, wolf in greediness, bark in madness, lion in prey. Let not the creaking of shoes or the rustling of silks betray thy poor heart to woman. Keep thy foot out of brothels, thy hand out of blackets, thy pen from lenders' books, and defy the foul fiend. <laughs> and through the horsemen blows a full wind, says, Soon, <gasps> Not the Dolphin, my boy. Boy, say, say. Let him trot by. Thou wert better in the grave than to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies. Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Ah, uh, here's three on us are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. An accommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off, you lendings. Come and button here. Freddy Nuncombe, be content here. It is a lofty night to swim in. <laughs> Now a little fire in a wild field like an old lecher's heart. A small spark, all the rest of his body cold. Look! Here comes a walking fire! Uh, this is the foul fiend flipping the gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks at first cock. He gives the breath and the pin squints the eye and makes the hair lift, mildews the white wheat and hurts the poor creature of earth. Swiveled footed, thrice the old, he met the nightmare and her ninefold. Bid her alight and her throat flight, and I ruined thee, witch! I ruined thee! How fares your grace? What's he? Who's there? What is your seek? What are you there? Your names? Uh, uh, poor Tom, that eats the swimming frog, the toad, the tadpole, the wall newt, and the warden. And in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salad, swallows the old rat and the ditch dog, drinks the green mantle of the standing ghoul, who is whipped from tithing to tithing and stocked, punished and imprisoned, who has had three suits to his back, six shirts to his body, horse to ride and weapon to wear. But mice and rats and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long years. Beware, my follower. Peace, Mocky. Peace, thou fiend. But hath your grace no better company? The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. Modo he's called, and Mahu. Our flesh and blood, my lord, is grown so vile that it doth hate what gets it. Tom's a cool. Go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. 
Though their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you, yet have I ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready. First, let me talk with this philosopher. What is the cause of thunder? Good, my lord, take his offer. Go into the house. I'll talk a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin. Let me ask you one word. In private? Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. You canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Ah, uh, that good Kent, he said it would be thus. Poor banished man. Thou sayest the king grows mad. I'll tell thee, friend, I am almost mad myself. I had a son, now outlawed from my blood. He sought my life, but lately, very late, I loved him, friend. No father, his son dearer. Truth to tell thee, the grief hath crazed my wits. What a nice this. I do beseech your grace. Oh, cry you, mercy, sir. Noble philosopher, your company. Tom's a cold. In, fellow there, into the hovel. Keep thee warm. Nay, come, let's in all. Uh, this way, my lord. With him I will keep still with my philosopher. Good, my lord, soothe him. Let him take the fellow. Take him, you on. Sir, uh, come on, go along with us. Come, good Athenians. No words. No words. Uh, hush. Child Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still, I foe and thumb. I smell the blood of a British man. I will have my revenge ere I depart his house. How, my lord, I may be censured that nature thus gives way to loyalty, something fears me to think of. I now perceive it was not altogether your brother's evil disposition made him seek his death, but a provoking merit set at work by a reprovable badness in himself. How malicious is my fortune that I must repent to be just. This is the letter which he spoke of, which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Oh, heavens, that this treason were not, or not I, the detector. Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find him comforting the king, it will stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay my trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a dear father in my love. Here is better than the open air. Take it thankfully. I will piece out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from you. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. The gods reward your kindness. Frateretto calls me and tells me Nero is an angler in the Lake of Darkness. A gray innocent angler, what are the foul things? Uh, Prithee, Uncle, tell me, whether a madman be a gentleman or a yeoman? A king? A king? No, he's a yeoman that had a gentleman to his son. He's a mad yeoman that sees his son, a gentleman before him. To have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in upon him. The foul fiend bites my back. He's mad that trusts in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, <laughs> or a whore's oath. It shall be done. I will arraign them straight. Come sit thou here, most learned justice. Thou sapient sir, sit here. Now, you she-foxes. Look where he stands and glares. Wants thou eyes a trial, madam? Come all the bond Bessie to me. Her boat hath a leak, and she must not speak why she dares not come over to thee. Uh, the thou fiend haunts poor Tom in the voice of a nightingale. Top dance cries in Tom's belly for two white herring. Croak not, black angel, I have no food for thee. How do you, sir? Stand you not so amazed. Will you lie down and rest upon the cushions? I'll see their trial first. Bring in their evidence. Thou robed man of justice, take thy place. 
But I always yoke fellow of equity benched by his side. You order the commission, sit you too. Let us deal justly. Sleepest or wakest thou, jolly shepherd, thy sheep be in the corn. And for one blast of thy minikin mouth, thy sheep shall take no harm. Per the cat is grave. A rain of her first, tis gone real. I here take my oath before this honourable assembly. She kicked the poor king, her father. Come hither, mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. Oh, crying mercy. I took you for a joint stool. And here's another whose warped looks proclaim what stone her heart is made on. Stop her there. Arms, arms, sword, fire. Corruption of the place, false justice, why hast thou let her escape? Bless thy five wits. Oh, pity. Sir, where is the patience now that you so oft have boasted to retain? My tears begin to take this part so much they mar my counterfeiting. The little dogs and all, Trey, Blanche, and Sweetheart, see they bark at me. <laughs> Tom will throw his head at them. Avaunt, you curse. Be thy mouth or black or white, tooth of poisons if it bite, mastiff, greyhound, mongrel, grim, hound or spaniel, black or limb, or bob, tail, tyke or tangled tail. Tom will make him weep and wail. For with throwing thus my head, dogs leap the hatch and all are fled. Do he do Say, say, come, march to wakes and fairs and market towns. Poor Tom, thy horn is dry. Then let them anatomize Riga. See what breeds about her heart. Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? You say, I entertain for one of my hundred. Only I. I do not like the fashion of your garments. You will say they are Persian, but let them be changed. No, good my lord. Lie here and rest a while. Make no noise. Make no noise. Draw the curtains. So. So. We'll go to supper in the morning. <laughs> and I'll have go to bed at noon. Come hither, friend. Where is the king, my master? Here, sir. But trouble him not. His wits are gone. Good friend. I pray thee, take him in thy arms. I have overheard a plot of death upon him. Oh. There is a litter ready, lament, and drive toward Dover, friend, where thou shalt meet both welcome and protection. Take up thy master. If thou shouldst dally half an hour, his life with thine and all that offer to defend him stand in assured loss. Take up, take up, and follow me that will to some provision give thee quick conduct. Oppressed nature sleeps. This rest might yet have balmed thy broken sinews, which if convenience will not allow, stand in hard cure. Come, help to bear thy master. Thou must not stay behind. Come. Come away. When we are better see bearing our woes, we scarcely think our miseries our foes. Who alone suffers, suffers most of the mind, leaving free things and happy shows behind. But then the mind much sufferance doth or skip when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. How light and portable my pain seems now, when that which makes me bend makes the king bow. He childed as I fathered. Tom, away. Mark the high noises, and thyself bewray when false opinion, whose wrong thoughts defile thee, in thy just proof repeals and reconciles thee. What will have more tonight? Safe scape the king. Look. Look. Oh, speak.
speedily to my lord, your husband. Show him this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the traitor, Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father are not fit for your beholding. Advise the Duke where you are going to a most festinate preparation. We are bound to the like. Our post shall be swift and intelligent betwixt us. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. Oh, now where's the king? My lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence. Some five or six and thirty of his knights, hot questrists after him, met him at gate, who, with some other of the lord's dependents, are gone with him toward Dover, where they boast to have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Farewell, sweet lord and sister. Edmund, farewell. Go seek the traitor Gloucester. Pinion him like a thief. Bring him before us. Oh, well, we may not pass upon his life without the form of justice. Yet our power shall do a courtesy to our wrath, which men may blame, but not control. Who's there? The traitor. And grateful fox, tis he. Bind fast his cocky arms. What means, your graces? Good, my friends, consider you are my guests. Do me no foul play, friend. Bind him, I say. Hard, hard. Oh. Filthy traitor. Unmerciful lady as you are, I'm none. To this chair, bind him. Villain, thou shalt find. Uh, by the kind gods, tis most ignobly done to pluck me by the beards. Oh, uh, such a traitor? Naughty lady. These hairs which thou dost ravish from my chin will quicken and accuse thee. I am your host. With robber's hands, my hospitable favours you should not ruffle thus. Will you do? Come, sir. What letters had you late from France? Be simple, answered, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors late footed in the kingdom? To whose hands you have sent the lunatic king? Speak. I have a letter guessingly set down, which came from one that's of a neutral heart, and not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Where hast thou sent the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Hast thou not charged at peril? Wherefore to Dover? Let him answer that. I'm tired to the stake, and I must stand the course. Wherefore to Dover? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick boarish fangs. The sea, with such a storm as his bare head in hell black night endured, would have buoyed up and quenched the stellid fires. Yet, poor old heart, he halt the heavens to rain. If wolves had at thy gate howled that stern time, thou shouldst have said, Good porter, turn the key. All cruel they'll subscribe. But I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. See it shalt thou never. Fellows, hold the chair. Upon these eyes of thine, I'll set my foot. He that will think to live, tell me old, give me some help. Oh, cruel. Oh, One side will mock another. The other, too. If you see vengeance. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child. But better service have I never done you than now to bid you home. Come now, you dog. If you did wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it on this quarrel. What do you mean? My villain. Nay, hey, then, come on, and take the chance of anger. Oh. Give me my sword of peasant. Stand up, lad. Oh, I am slain. My lord, you have one eye left to see some mischief. Lest it see more oh, prevented. Oh, Ouch! Ah, Where is thy ah, luster ah, now? Ah, oh. <laughs> Act. 
treacherous oh. villain, thou callest on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. My folly. And Edgar was abused. Kind gods, forgive me that. Oh, and prosper him. Go thrust him out of the gates. Let him smell his way to Dover. How is my lord? How look you? I have received a hurt. Ooh. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless oh. villain. Oh. Throw this slave upon the dunghill. Regan, I plead a place. Oh. Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. I'll never care what wickedness I do if this man come to good. If she live long and in the end meet the old course of death, women will all turn monsters. Let's follow the old earl and get the bedlam to lead him where he would. His roguish madness allows itself to anything. Go thou. I'll fit some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now, heaven help him. Yet better thus and known to be contemned than still contemned and flattered. To be worst, the lowest and most dejected thing of fortune stands still in esperance, lives not in fear. The lamentable change is from the best. The worst returns to laughter. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial heir that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown unto the worst owes nothing to thy blasts. But who comes here? My father, poorly led. World, world, oh world. But that thy strange mutations make us hate thee. Life would not yield to age. Oh, my good lord, I have been your tenant and your father's tenant these fourscore years. Away. Get thee away. Good friend, be gone. Thy comforts can do me no good at all. Thee, they may hurt. You cannot see your way. I have no way. Therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw. Full oft to see our means secure us, and our mere defects prove our commodities. Oh, dear son, Edgar, the food of thy abused father's wrath. Might I but live to see thee in my touch. I'd say I had eyes again. Hello. Who's there? Oh, God. Who is can say I am at the worst? I am worse than e'er I was. Uh, it is poor mad Tom. And worse I may be yet. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Hello. Where goest? Is it a beggar man? Mad man, uh, and beggar too. He has some reason as he could not beg. In the last night's storm, I such a fellow saw which made me think a man a worm. My son came then into my mind, and yet my mind was then scarce friends with him. I have heard more since. As flies to wanton boys, are we to the gods? They kill us, their sport. How should this be? 
bad is the trade that must play fool to sorrow, angering itself and others. Bless thee, master. Is that the naked fellow? Aye, my lord. Then pretty get thee away. If, for my sake, thou wilt take us hence a mile or twain in the way toward Dover, do it for ancient love and bring some covering for this naked soul, which I'll entreat to lead me. Thy lack, sir, he is mad. <laughs> Tis the time's plague, when madmen lead the blind. Do as I bid thee, or rather, do thy pleasure. Above the rest, be gone. I'll bring him the best barrel that I have. Come on to what will. Sirrah, naked fellow. Poor Tom's a coat. I cannot top it for. Come hither, fellow. And yet I must. Lest thy sweet eyes. They bleed. Knowst thou the way to Dover? Both stile and gate. Horseway and footpath. Poor Tom hath been scared out of his good wit. Bless thee, goodman's son, from the foul thing. Five fiends have been in poor Tom at once, of lust, as Obidicuk, Hobbididens, Prince of Dumbness, Mahu of stealing, Modo of murder, Flibber de Gibbet of moping and mowing, who since possesses chambermaids and waiting women. So bless thee, master. Here. Take this purse, you whom the heaven's plagues have humbled to all strokes. I am wretched makes thee happier. Heavens deal so still. Let the superfluous and lust-dieted man that slaves your ordinance, that will not see because he does not feel, feel your power quickly. So distribution should undo excess, and each man have enough. Dost thou know, Dover? Aye, master. There is a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall no leading need. Give me thy arm. Poor Tom shall lead thee. <laughs> Welcome, my lord. Madam. I marvel our mild husband not met us on the way. Now, where's your master? Madam, within, but never man so changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was the worse of Gloucester's treachery and of the loyal service of his son when I informed him. Then he called me sot and told me I had turned the wrong side out. What most he should dislike seems pleasant to him. What like offends him. Then shall you go no further. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs which tie him to an answer. Our wishes on the way may prove effects. Back, Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. I must change arms at home and give the distaff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long, you are like to hear, if you dare venture on your own behalf, a mistress's command. Wear this. Spare speech. Decline your head. This kiss, if it durst speak, would stretch thy spirits up into the air. Conceive and fare thee well. Yours in the ranks of death. My most dear Gloss. The difference of man and man. To thee, a woman's services are due. A fool usurps my body. Madam, here comes my lord. I have been worth the whistle. 
O Goneril, you are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. I fear your disposition. That nature which contends in the origin cannot be bored and certain in itself. She that herself will sliver and disbranch from her material sap. The force must wither and come to deadly use. No more, the text is foolish. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. Filth safer but themselves, what have you done? Tigers, not daughters, what have you performed? A father and a gracious aged man, whose reverence even the head-lugged bear would lick. Most barbarous, most degenerate, have you madded? Could my good brother suffer you to do it? A man, a prince by him so benefited? If that the heavens do not their visible spirits send quickly down to tame this vile offence, it will come. Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. Milk-livered man that bears a cheek for blows, a head for wrongs, who hast not in thy brows an eye discerning thine honour from thy suffering, that not knowest fools do those villains pity who are punished ere they have done their mischief. Where's thy drum? France spreads his banners in our noiseless land. With plumed helm, thy state begins to threat. Whilst thou, a moral fool, sits still and cries, Alack, why does he so? See thyself, devil. Proper deformity seems not in the fiend so horrid as in woman. Oh, <laughs> vain fool. Thou change it, and self-covered thing for shame. <laughs> Be monster not thy feature. Were it my fitness to let these hands obey my blood, they are apt enough to dislocate and tear thy flesh and bones. How oh, without a fiend a woman's shape doth shield thee. Marry your manhood, Mew. What news? Oh, my good lord, the Duke of Cornwall's dead, slain by his servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eyes? A servant that he bred, thrilled with remorse, opposed against the act, bending his sword to his great master, who thereat in rage flew on him, and amongst them felled him dead, but not without that harmful stroke which since hath plucked him after. This shows you are above you justices, that these are never crimes so speedily convenge. But, oh, poor Gloucester, lost he his other eye? Both, both, my lord. This letter, madam, craves a speedy answer. Tis from your sister. One way I like this well, but being widow, and my Gloucester with her, may all the building in my fancy pluck upon my hateful life. Another way, the news is not so tart. I'll read and answer. Where was his son when they did take his eyes? Come with my lady, hither. He is not here? No, my good lord. I met him back again. Knows he the wickedness? I, my good lord. Twas he informed against him, and quit the house on purpose that their punishment might have the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showedst the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend. Tell me what more thou knowest. Why the King of France is so suddenly gone back? Know you no reason? Something he left imperfect in the state, which since his coming forth is thought of, which imports to the kingdom so much fear and danger that his personal return was most required and necessary. Well, who hath he left behind him, General? The Marshal of France, Monsieur Lafarge. Did your letters pierce the Queen to any demonstration of grief? Aye, sir. She took them, read them in my presence, and now and then an ample tear trilled down her delicate cheek. It seemed she was a queen over her passion, who most rebel-like sought to be king or her. Oh, then it moved her. Not to a rage. Patience and sorrow strove who should express her good list. You have seen sunshine and rain at once. Her smiles and tears were like a better way. Those happy smilets that played on her right lip seemed not to know what guests were in her eyes which parted thence as pearls from diamonds drop. In brief, sorrow would be a rarity most beloved if all could so become it. Made she no verbal question? Faith, once or twice she heaved the name of father, mm. pantingly forth as if it pressed her heart, 
described sisters, sisters, shame of ladies, sisters, Kent, father, sisters, what if a storm in a night, let pity not be believed. There she shook the holy water from her heavenly eyes, and clamor moistened her. Then away she started to deal with grief alone. It is the stars. The stars above us govern our conditions, else one self-made and made could not beget such different issues. You spoke not with her since? No. Was this before the king returned? No, since. Well, sir, the poor distressed leers of the town, who sometime in his better tune remembers what we are come about, and by no means will yield to see his daughter. Why, good sir? The sovereign shame so elbows him. His own unkindness that stripped her from his benediction, turned her to foreign casualties, gave her dear rights to his dog-hearted daughters. These things sting his mind so venomously that burning shame detains him from Cordelia. Alack, poor gentleman. Of Albany's and Cornwall's powers you heard not. Tis so. They are afoot. Well, sir, I'll bring you to our master Lear and leave you to attend him. Some dear cause will in concealment wrap me up a while. When I am known aright, you shall not grieve lending me this acquaintance. I pray you go along with me. Alack, tis he. Why, he was met even now as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud, crowned with rank fumiter and furrow weeds, with burdocks, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, darnel, and all the idle weeds that grow in our sustaining corn. A century sent forth. Search every acre in the high grown field and bring him to our eye. What can man's wisdom and the store in his bereaved sense? He that helps him take all my outward worth. There is means, madam. Our foster nurse of nature is reposed, the which he lacks, and that to provoke in him are many simples operative, whose power will close the eye of anguish. All blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with my tears. Be aidant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him, lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. News, madam, the British powers are marching hitherward. Tis known before, our preparation stands in expectation of them. Oh, dear father, it is thy business that I go about. Therefore, great France, my mourning and importune tears hath pitied. No blown ambition doth our arms incite, but love, dear love. And our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. But are my brother's powers set forth? Aye, madam. Himself in person madam, there? Madam, with much ado, your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. What might import my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Faith, he is posted hence on serious matter. It was great ignorance, Gloucester's eyes being out, to let him live. Where he arrives, he moves all hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone in pity of his misery to dispatch his knighted life. Moreover, to descry the strength of the enemy. I must needs after him, madam, with my letter. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? The like some things I know not what. I love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather... I know your lady does not love her husband. I am sure of that. And at her late being here, she gave strange riads and most speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam. I speak in understanding. You are, I note. Therefore, I do advise you take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked, and more convenient is he for my hand than for your lady's. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you give him this. And when your mistress hears thus much from you, I pray desire her, call her wisdom to her. So fare you well. If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, 
The ferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would I could meet him, madam. I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. shall I come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up it now. Look how we labor. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark. Do you hear the sea? No. Why then, your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes anguish. So may it be indeed. Methinks thy voice is altered. Thou speakst in better phrase and matter than thou didst. So I'm much deceived. In nothing am I changed but in my garments. Methinks thinks you are better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy it is to cast one's eye so low. The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire. Dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon the tall anchoring bark diminished to a cock, a cock, a boy almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the numbered idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more. As my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Let go my hand. Here, friends, another purse. In it, a jewel well worth a poor man's taking. There is, and God's prosper it with thee. Go thou further off. Bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Now fare you well, good sir, with all my heart. I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. Oh, the mighty gods, this world I do renounce and in your sights shake patiently my great affliction of. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, bless him. Now, fellow, Fare thee well. Gone, sir. <laughs> Farewell. But yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought, by this had thought been passed. <laughs> Alive or dead? Oh, you, sir. Friend. Uh, hear you, sir? Speak. Thus might he pass indeed. Yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away. Let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air so many fathom down precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe. Hast heavy substance? Eats not. Speak'st? Art sound? Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life's a miracle. Speak it again. But have I fallen, or no? From the dread summit of this chalky bourne. Look up a height. The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Alack, I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Twas yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. Give me your arm. <laughs> so, how is it? Feel you your legs? You stand. Too well. Too well. 
This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns whelked and waved like the enriched sea. It was some fiend. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honours of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. I do remember now. Henceforth, I'll bear affliction till it'll cry out itself enough, enough, and I. That thing you speak of, I took it for a man. Often t'would say, the fiend, the fiend. He led me to that place. They're free and patient folk. But who comes here? No. No. The safer sense will ne'er accommodate his master, though. No. They cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. Oh, thou side piercing sight. Nature is above art in that respect. Where's your press money? That fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look. Look, the mass. Is that not a piece of his? This piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. I'll prove it on a giant. Bring up the brown bills. Bow! Well-flown bird in a cloud, in a cloud. Give the word. Sweet marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. Ah, uh, Goneril with the white beard. They flattered me like a dog. They told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones are there. To say I and no to everything that I said, I and no too was no good divinity. And the rain came to wet me once, and the wind to make me chatter. When the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found them, there I smelt them out. Go to they not many their words. They told me I was everything. It's a lie. I'm not ague proof. The trick of that voice I do well remember. He's not a king. I every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery, thou shalt not die, die for adultery, no. The ring goes to it, and the small gilded fly that lecture in my sight. Let copulation thrive! For Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's got tween the lawful sheets. To it luxury, bell-mell, for I lack soldiers. Behold your simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow, that minced his virtue, and doth shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. The fitchel, not a soiled horse, goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist they are centaurs, the women all above, but to the girdle do the gods inherit beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there's a sulphurous pit burning, scalding, stench consumption. Fade, 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 bah, bah, bah. Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary. Sweeten my imagination. There's money for thee. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Oh, ruined piece of nature. This great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squinny at me? No. Do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. Read thou this challenge. Mark but the penning of it. Where all thy letters, sons, I 
could not see. I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Read. <laughs> with the case of eyes. Oh, oh, are you there with me? No eyes in your head and no money in your purse. Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light. Yet you see how this world goes. I see it feelingly. But art mad. A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. Behold yon justice rail on yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear. Change places and handy dandy. Which is the justice and which is the thief? <laughs> you seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar? Aye. And the creature ran from the cur. There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. A dog is obeyed in office. O oh, rascal, be all thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lusts to use her in that kind for which thou whipst her. The usurer hangs the cousin up. Through tattered clothes, great vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plate sin with gold. And the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Armored in rags, a pygmy straw does pierce it. None does offend. None. I say none. I labor them. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes. And like the scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. No, 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 no. Pull up my boots. Harder, harder, so. Oh, matter and impertinence in me. Reason in madness. <laughs> if thou wilt weep, thy fortunes take my eyes. I know thee well enough, thy name is Gloss. <laughs> I must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we roar and cry. I will all preach to thee. Mark. Alack, alack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. It's a good block were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put it to the proof. And when I have stolen upon these son-in-laws, then kill! 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 Oh, kill! Oh, yes! Kill! Lay hand upon him! <coughs> sir, ah. sir, oh, most dear daughter. Oh, what no rescue! What a prisoner! I mean, in the natural fool of fortune, Use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. I'm cut to the brains. You shall have anything. No seconds. All myself. Or this to make a man a man of salt. To use his eyes for garden water pots. I am laying autumn's dust. Good I will die bravely. Like a smug bridegroom. Huh? I will be jovial. Come, come. I am a king, my masters. Know you that? You are a royal one, and we obey you. Then there's life in it. Come, and you get it. You shall get it running. Sa, 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 sa. A sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast a daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Spur speedy. What's your will? Do you hear aught, sir, of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar. Everyone hears that which can distinguish sound. But by your favor, how near is the other army? Near. And on speedy foot, the main disguise stands on the hourly foot. I thank you, sir. That's all. Though that the queen on special cause is here, her army is moved on. I thank you, sir. You, ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. 
Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, Father. Now, good sir, what are you? A most poor man made tame to fortune, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows am pregnant to good pity. Give me your hand. I'll lead you to some biding. Hearty thanks, the bounty and the benison of heaven to boot. And boot a proclaimed prize, most happy. That eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Yeah. Thou old unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember, the sword is out that must destroy thee. Sir, now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. Wherefore, bold peasant, dost thou support a published traitor? Hence, lest that the infection of his fortune take light hold on thee. Let go his arm. Shall not let go, sir, without further occasion. Let go, slave of the dice. Good gentleman, go your gate and let poor folk pass. And should have been swaggered out of my life, would not have been so long as tis by a fortnight. Nay, come not near the old man. <laughs> Keep out, your boy. Or I'll try whether your costard or my ballow be the harder. Shall be plain with you. Bounce down hill. It shall pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter for your foins. No. <laughs> slave, thou hast slain me. <laughs> Villain, take my purse. Ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body in. And give the letters which thou findst about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. <laughs> Seek him out upon the English party. Oh, untimely death. <sighs> ah, I know thee well. A serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What? Is he dead? Sit you down, father. Rest you. Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. If he's dead, I'm only sorry he had no other deaths, ma'am. Let us see. Leave gentle wax and manners. Blame us not, to know our enemies' minds, we rip their hearts. Their papers is more lawful. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. If your will want not, time and place will be fruitfully offered. There is nothing done. If you return the conqueror, then I am the prisoner, and his bed my jail. From the loathed warmth whereof, Deliver me and supply the place for your labor. Your wife, so I would say, affectionate servant, Goneril. Oh, undistinguished space of woman's will. A plot upon her virtuous husband's life and the exchange, my brother. Here in the sands thee I'll rake up the post unsanctified of murderous lechers. And in the mature time, with this ungracious paper, strike the sight of the death-practiced duke. For him tis well thy death and business I can tell. King, mad, how stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feeling of my huge sorrows. Better I were distract, or should my thoughts be severed from my griefs and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves? Give me your hand. Far off, methinks I heard the beaten drum. Come, Father, I'll bestow you with a friend.
O oh, thou good Kent, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short and every measure fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is all paid. All my reports go with the modest truth. No more, nor clipped, but so. Be better suited. These weeds are memories of those worser hours. I prithee put them on. Pardon, dear madam. Yet to be known shortens my made intent. My boon I make it, that you know me not till time and I think meet. Then be it so, my good lord. How does the king? Madam, sleeps still. Oh, you kind gods. Cure this great breach in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, oh, wind up of this child change of father. So please, your majesty, that we may wake the king. He hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge and proceed to the sway of your own will. Is he arrayed? Aye, madam. In the heaviness of sleep, we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam, when we do awake him. I doubt if his temperance. Very well. Please, you draw near. Louder the music there. Restoration hang thy medicine on my lips, and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kind and dear princess. Had you not been there, father, these white flakes did challenge pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds? To stand against the deep, dread, bolted thunder. And the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning. To watch poor Perdu with his thin helm. Mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. And was thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues forlorn in short and musty straw. Lack, lack, tis wonder that thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. <laughs> he wakes. Speak to him. Madam, do you. Tis fittest. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? Do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire with mine own tears to scald like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You have a spirit, I know. When did you die? Still, still far wide. Oh, he's scarce awake. Let him alone. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. I am mightily abused. I should e'en die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pin prick. Would I were assured of my condition? Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hand in benediction on me. You must not kneel. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Four score and upward, not an hour, more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man, but I am doubtful. For I am mainly ignorant what place this is, and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I Be your tears wet. 
his faith. I pray weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause, no cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. And yet it is danger to make him even nor the time he is lost. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more till further settling. Will it please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now. Forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Oh, is it true, sir, that the Duke of Cornwall was so slain? Most certain, sir. Who is conductor of these people? Yes, to say, the bastard son of Gloucester. And they say Edgar, his banished son, is with the Earl of Kent in Germany. The report is changeable. It is time to look about. The powers of the kingdom approach apace. The arbitrament is like to be bloody. Fare you well, sir. My point and period will be thoroughly wrought, or well, or ill, as this day's battles fought. <laughs> If his last purpose hold, or whether since he is advised by aught to change the course. He's full of alteration and self-reproving. Bring his constant pleasure. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried. It is to be doubted, madam. Now, sweet lord, you know the goodness I intend upon you. Tell me but truly, but then speak the truth. Do you not love my sister? In honoured love. But have you never found my brother's way to the forfended place? That thought abuses you. I am doubtful that you have been conjunct and bosomed with her as far as we call hers. No. By mine honor, madam. I never shall endure her, dear my lord. Be not familiar with her. Fear not. She and the duke are husband. I had rather lose the battle than that sister should loosen him and me. Our very loving sister will be met. Sir, this I heard. The king is come to his daughter with others whom the rigor of our state forced to cry out. Where I could not be honest, I never yet was valiant. For this business it touches us as France invades our land, not bowls the king with others whom I fear most just and heavy causes make oppose. Sir, you speak nobly. Why is this reason combined together against the enemy for these domestic and particular broils are not the question here? Let's then determine with the Ancient of War on our proceedings. I shall attend you presently at your tent. Sister, you will go with us? No. It is most convenient. Pray, go with us. Oh, 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 I know the riddle. I will go. If e'er your grace had speech with man so poor, hear me one word. I'll overtake you. Speak. Before you fight the battle, ope this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound for him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion that will prove what is about there. If you miscarry, your business of the world hath so an end, and machination ceases. Fortune love you. Stay till I have read the letter. I was forbid it. When time shall serve, let but the herald cry, and I'll appear again. Why, fare thee well. I will all look thy paper. The enemy's in view. Draw up your powers. Here is the guess of their true strength and forces by diligent discovery. But your haste is now urged on you. We will greet the time. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other as the stung are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? Both? One? Or neither? 
neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the widow exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril. And hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband being alive. Now then, we'll use his countenance for the battle, which being done, let her who will be rid of him devise his speedy taking off. As for the mercy which he intends to Lear and to Cordelia, the battle done and they within our power shall never see his pardon. For my state stands on me to defend, not to debate. shadow of this tree for your good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Grace, go with you, sir. have lost he and his daughter ten give me thy hand come on no further sir a man may rot even here rot in ill thoughts again men must endure their going hence even as they're coming hither ripeness is all come on that's true too Officers, take them away. Good guard until their greater pleasures first be known that are to censure them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. Mm. For thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else outfrown false fortunes frowned. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No. No. No, no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in a cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. And we'll talk with them, too. Who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out. And take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies. And we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Take them away. Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. Have I caught thee? He that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven and fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes. The good years shall devour them, flesh and fell, ere they shall make us weep. We'll see him starve first. Come. Come hither, Captain. Hark. Take thou this note. Go follow them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost as this instructs thee, thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. Know thou this, that men are as the time is. Sir. To be tender-minded does not become a sword. 
Thy great employment will not be a question. Either say thou'll do it, or thrive by other means. I'll do it, my lord. About it, and right happy when thou hast done. Mark, I say, instantly, and carry it so as I have set it down. I cannot draw a cart, nor eat dried oats. If it be man's work, I'll do it. Sir, you have showed today your valiant strain, and fortune led you well. You have the captives who were the opposites of this day's strife. I do require them of you so to use them, as we shall find their merits and our safety may equally determine. Sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention, whose age has charms in it, whose title more, to pluck the common bosom on his side and turn our impressed lances in our eyes which do command them. With him I sent the queen, my reason all the same, and they are ready tomorrow or at further space to appear where you shall hold your session. At this time we sweat and bleed. Friend hath lost his friend, and the best quarrels in the heat are cursed by those that feel their sharpness. The question of Cordelia and her father requires a fitter place. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. That's as we list to grace him. Methinks our pleasure might have been demanded ere you had spoke so far. He led our powers, bore the commission of my place and person. The which immediacy may well stand up and call itself your brother. Not so hot in his own grace he doth exalt himself more than in your addition. In my rights, by me invested, he compares the best. That for the most if he should husband you. Jesters do oft prove prophets. Oh, Allah, Allah, that I that told you so looked but a squint. Lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full-flowing stomach. General, take thou my soldiers, prisoners, patrimony, dispose of them, of me, the walls is thine. Witness the world that I create thee here, my lord and master. Mean you to enjoy him? But that alone lies not in your goodwill. Nor in thine, lord. Half bloody fellow, yes. Let the drum strike and prove my title thine. Stay yet, hear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason. And in thy arrest, this gilded serpent. For your claim, fair sister, I bar it in the interest of my wife. Tis she is subcontracted to this lord, and I, her husband, contradict your bans. If you will marry, make your loves to me. My lady is bespoke. An interlude. Thou art armed, Gloucester, let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy person thy heinous, manifest, and many treasons, there is my pledge. I'll make it on thy heart ere I taste bread. Thou art in nothing less than I have here proclaimed thee. Sick. If not, I'll ne'er trust medicine. There's my exchange. What in the world he is that names me traitor, villain like he lies. Call by the trumpet. He that dares approach on him, on you, who not? I will maintain my truth and honor firmly. A herald, ho! A herald, ho! A herald, trust to thy single virtue. For thy soldiers, all levied in my name, have in my name took their discharge. My sickness grows upon me. She is not well. Convey her to my tent. Come hither, herald. Let the trumpet sound and read out this. If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmund, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor, let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defense. Sound. Again. Again. Ask him his purposes, why he appears upon this call of the trumpet. What are you, your name, your quality, and why you answer this present summons? No, my name is lost, thy treason's tooth, bear norn and canker bit. Yet am I noble as the adversary I come to cope. Which is that adversary? What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What sayst thou to him? Draw thy sword. But if my speech offend a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Here is mine. Behold, it is my privilege, the privilege of mine honor, my oath, and my profession. I protest, Morga, thy strength, place, youth, and eminence, despite thy victor sword and fire new fortune, thy valor, and thy heart, thou art a traitor, false to thy gods, Thy brother and thy father conspire against this high illustrious prince 
and from the extremest upward of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Say thou no, this sword, this arm, and my best spirits are bent to prove upon thy heart whereto I speak, thou liest. In wisdom I should ask thy name. But since thy outside looks so fair and warlike, and that thy tongue some say of breeding breathes, what safe and nicely I might well delay by rule of knighthood, I disdain and spurn. Back do I toss these treasons to thy head, with the hell-hated lie o'erwhelm my heart, which for they yet glance by and scarcely bruise, this sword of mine shall give them instant way where they shall rest for ever. Trumpet, speak! This is practice, Gloucester. By the law of war, thou wast not bound to answer an unknown opposite. Thou art not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled. Shut your mouth, dame, or with this paper shall I stop it. Hold, sir. Thou wast in any name. Read thine own evil. No telling, lady, I perceive you know it. Say if I do, the laws are mine, not thine. Who can array me for it? Most monsters, oh, no star this oh, paper. Ask me not what I know. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. What you have charged me with, that have I done. And more, much more, the time will bring it out. It is past, and so am I. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. Ah, spoken right. Tis true, the wheel has gone full circle. I am here. But forth thy very gate did prophesy a royal nobleness. I must embrace thee. Let sorrow split my heart if ever I did hate thee or thy father. Worthy prince, I know it. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord. List a brief tale, and when tis told, oh, that my heart would burst. The bloody proclamation to escape that followed me so near, oh, our lives' sweetness, that we, the pain of death, would hourly die rather than die at once, taught me to shift into a madman's rags, to assume a semblance that very dogs disdained. And in this habit met I my father with his bleeding rings, their precious stones new lost, became his guide, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair. Never, O oh, fault, revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armed. Not sure, though hoping of this good success, I asked his blessing, and from first to last told him our pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, alack, too weak the conflict to support, twixt two extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst smilingly. This speech of yours hath moved me, and shall perchance do good. But speak you on. You look as you had something more to say. If there be more, more woeful, hold it in, for I am almost ready to dissolve hearing of this. This would have seemed a period to such as love not sorrow. But another, to amplify too much, would make much more in top extremity. Whilst I was big in clamour, came there in a man who, having seen me in my worst estate, shunned my abhorred society. But then, finding who t'was that so endured, with his strong arms he fastened on my neck and bellowed out as he'd burst heaven, threw him on my father, told the most piteous tale of Lear and him that ever he received which in recounting his grief grew puissant and the strings of life began to crack. Twice then the trumpet sounded, and there I left him, tranced. But who was this? Kent, sir. The banished Kent, who in disguise followed his enemy king and did him service improper for a slave. Help! Help! Oh, help! What kind of help? Speak, man! What means this bloody knife? It is hard. It 
She smokes. It came even from the heart. Of... Oh, she's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir. Your lady. And her sister by her is poisoned. She <laughs> confesses. <laughs> I was contracted to them both. All three now marry in an instant. Here comes Kent. Produce the bodies, be they alive or dead. This judgment of the heavens that makes us tremble touches us not with pity. Oh, is this he? The time will not allow the compliment which very manners urges. I am come to bid my king and master a good night. Is he not here? Great thing of us forgot! Speak, Edmund! Where's the king? And where's Cordelia? Seest thou this object, Kent? Ah, why thus? Yet Edmund was beloved. The one the other poisoned for my sake, and after slew herself. Even so, come on their faces. I pant for life. Some good I mean to do, despite of mine own nature. <coughs> Quickly send, be brief in it, to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Lear and on Cordelia. What? Nay, send in time. Run, run, oh, run! To whom, my lord? <coughs> Who has the office? Send thy token of reprieve. Well thought of, take my sword, give it the captain. Hasty for thy life. He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison and to lay the blame upon her own despair that she fordid herself. The gods defend her. Bear him hence a while. stones. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. Is this the promised end or image of that horror? Fall and cease. This feather stars, she lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Oh, my good master. Pretty away. It is noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved. Now she's gone forever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. Huh? What is thou sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low. An excellent thing in woman. I killed the slave that was a hanging thee. It is true, my lord, he did. Did I not, fellow? I have seen the day when with my good, biting falchion I'd have made him skip. I'm old now, and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? Mine eyes are not of the best, I'll tell you straight. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, one of them we behold. This is a dull sight. Are you not Kent? The same. Your servant, Kent. Mm. Where is your servant, Caius? He's a good fellow. I can tell you that. He'll strike, and quickly, too. He's dead and rotten. No, my good lord. I am the very man. I'll see that straight. That from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You are welcome, Hilda. No, no man else. Most cheerless, dark, and deadly. Your eldest daughters have fordone themselves and desperately are dead. I. So I think. He knows not what he says, and vain it is that we present us to him. Very bootless. Edmund is dead, my lord. That's but a trifle here. <sighs> you lords and noble friends know our intent. What comfort to this great decay may come shall be applied. For us, we will resign during the life of this old majesty to him our absolute power 
you to your rights, with boot and such addition as your honors have more than merited. All friends shall taste the wages of their virtue, and all foes the cup of their deservings. Oh, see, see. And my poor fool is hanged. No. Rat have life, and thou no breath at all. Thou'lt come no more. Never, 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 never. And will you undo this button? Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look, her lips. Look there, look there. Thanks. My lord? My lord? Break heart. Pretty break. Look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. He is gone indeed. The wonder is, he hath endured so long. Keep usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends of my soul, you twain, rule in this realm, and the gored state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. 